Here's our mission patch that uh, we all helped design with the eagle on the front. As I said, KSC gave us a very good vehicle, very few squawks during the flight, and of course that always makes our job easy. This is about the time when the excitement starts to build, when you're actually walking out to the vehicle and getting ready to launch. Just no way to walk gracefully in those orange pumpkin suits. <laughs> I guess I have the privilege of talking about Ascent. Uh, I can't help but get over the feeling that when you walk out to this vehicle, it's a living, breathing monster that's uh, waiting for your arrival. Here we're about three minutes prior to launch, and the main engine gimbals are moving to do the last minute checks of the thrust vectoring. I can look out my window and uh, see the uh, birds out in the pond, and they're in for a surprise. Watch here as the shock wave comes off the SRBs when it lights here. And uh, when that shock wave occurs, we uh, get boosted off the pad and uh, there's no doubt in your mind you're headed uphill. I can say from this experience that the, the ascent was less uncomfortable this time than it was the first time around, but you still have that sensation of not only being thrust on your back, but you also have a sensation of hanging upside down slightly as the thrust vector takes you toward the bottom of the orbiter. And uh, we're feeling the random vibrations that tell you with with no uncertainty that you've got controlled explosions going on around the vehicle. As we uh, go up to around 30 seconds into the flight, the main engines on the shuttle throttle back, and you can feel that as they throttle back, and then at about a minute, they throttle back up to 104% thrust, and uh, the acceleration builds to a little over 2.5 Gs at the time that the solid rocket boosters burn out. And when they burn out, you know that as well, because the thrust drops off and you're wondering where your thrust went. And as they separate, you get a big orange flash across the windscreen that uh, tells you they're on your way, and now you're on the main engines to continue uphill. Once they do separate, it's a very smooth ride. Once we get up on orbit, uh, we have to configure our rocket ship to, uh, to fly like a spaceship and be on orbit. So one of the first things we do is open our payload bay doors, and here you see it about uh, twice normal speed on the opening sequence. The payload bay doors have radiators on the inside uh, of them that reject heat from the electronics and, and the shuttle systems into space. In the payload bay, you see the uh, TDRS uh, satellite with its two antennas folded up umbrella-like fashion, as well as the uh, hexagonal feature there of the uh, solar arrays. In the foreground on either side of the sills of the payload bay, you see the DXS uh, sensors that we used uh, later on in the flight after deploy. We put those uh, to work uh, starting in about uh, uh, six and a half to seven hours. I was in charge of uh, the post-insertion activities. These are basically the things that happen right after the main engine's cut off and we start getting the uh, mid-deck and the flight deck prep for the on-orbit activities. And uh, I don't think we have too much footage like this from previous flights, but what this is, of course, is two of us trying to help one of the other people in the crew out of their flight suits. And as you can see, without gravity, it ends up being a little bit more of a fumble. Well, after about two hours, uh, we get ready to uh, go to work and uh, check out our satellite and uh, make sure it's still functioning correctly and get ready to deploy it at the six-hour mark. Here you see the rays of the uh, TDRS IUS stack from uh, the aft looking forward. That was about three times uh, normal speed in the sequence uh, on board. Uh, everybody is involved. Uh, the commander and pilot are working to keep the ship uh, trimmed correctly. And Susan and I are, are checking out the systems on the uh, TDRS and the IUS to make sure that uh, we're ready to go. In the background, you can see here the uh, Earth passage underneath the shuttle. And again, this is about three times normal speed. And about this sequence uh, in the film, we're getting ready to detach the umbilicals uh, that, that supply power from the orbiter to the IUS and the TDRS. Uh, once those are pulled, we're go for deploy, and uh, here you see the first part of the deploy sequence, the IUS nozzle clearing the uh, airborne uh, support equipment uh, structure in the back end, and here's the first view of the IUS TDRS as it leaves the shuttle's payload bay at about one foot per second. Subsequent to this time, uh, John, the commander, uh, will be performing a back-off maneuver, which will increase the separation rate uh, and give us a safe distance uh, to make sure we have no... Uh, uh, interference with the deploy sequence. One thing that's also inter interesting to mention is at this point, everyone in the crew is very busy. We've got John, who's basically flying the orbiter from an aft flight station. 
Uh, Greg is basically running all the photo TV documentation, and, and I'm helping him out as I can. Mario is the prime person for the deploy and throwing switches. This is a good scene right here of how everyone's trying to get at the windows to document the event. Don is up in the front working the, the rendezvous specs, make sure that we've got our, uh, we're able to tell the IUS Tedras where the orbiter is so they can keep track of each other. Uh, this is some footage that I shot with the uh, Aeroflex motion picture camera of the IUS as it backs away. The orbiter is backing away from the IUS, and the IUS continues to move along the direction in which it was pushed by the push-off springs of uh, the tilt table mechanism that it was attached to. And everyone's just very busy. That, that is a, a for sure thing during the deploy ops. What we've got here is uh, some footage that the ground was able to take of the DXS scanning. We basically put this into motion as soon as the IUS was out and away. And uh, there are two kilometers, one on either side of the payload bay. And both of these kilometers are scanning in equal and opposite directions. It doesn't appear to be that way from this footage here, but uh, that's because of the way the cameras were aimed at the various kilometers. Uh, in both cases, those things worked only during the night side, and during the day side, they basically closed themselves up to protect themselves against sunlight damage. Uh, while the kilometers were scanning, which basically occurred for the next five days, uh, Greg and Mario and I worked a variety of secondary experiments. Uh, this, for example, is a close-up of the CGBA experiment. We have a variety of um, bioprocessing samples on board that uh, we were in the middle of processing. Um, you can see there the lockers. We stowed most of our experiments in the lockers themselves and pulled them out as required in order to activate or deactivate them. This is footage from one of the in-flight uh, special cameras of the solid surface combustion experiment. This is actually a fire in space. It's plexiglass. The initial uh, orange glow there was the uh, initiator. And uh, this burn lasted for about 30 seconds. Um, the red glow there at the end is caused by a thermistor that the flame runs into towards the end of the, uh, the spread of the flame. Here you can see uh, Greg and I and John in the foreground. We're all busy getting ready for the EVA. Uh, what we're doing specifically here is uh, putting dishwashing liquid on our lenses. If any of you have played sports, you know that that's a defog agent. You wipe it on and then uh, clear it off, and that prevents the, your, your visor or face shield from fogging up. Uh, we're going through the final checks. Uh, Susan has uh, made great pains to uh, make sure that we are ready to go, that the suit fits properly. Uh, when the time came, we were anxious to get out the door. And uh, Susan and Don did the final airlock closeout, uh, made sure that there was a good seal around it. And then uh, I opened the airlock, the outer airlock hatch. As I did so, there was just a very small a uh, little bit of uh, air pressure left inside the airlock, and that popped open the thermal cover. Uh, we pulled the airlock hatch open, and then uh, shortly thereafter, after Mario and I got our tether configuration squared away, then I went outside and got us hooked up. This is a good view from the aft uh, flight deck of uh, the amount of effort that went into the EVA from the inside. Susan and Don and John were all very busy during the EVA to make sure that uh, we were uh, well choreographed and uh, well photo documented as we uh, perform the uh, four and a half hours of activities. You, you can see here I was exiting the airlock and uh, let me tell you that first view as you look up the forward bulkhead and see the earth for the first time with nothing between you and it is, uh, is quite an experience. Uh, here I am translating across, across the aft uh, airborne support equipment of the IUS. Uh, there weren't real terrific handholds there, but we wanted to evaluate that, among other things, uh, in this particular uh, payload configuration, and have found it acceptable. Okay, next you've got Mario setting up the foot restraint on the sill, and he's about to demonstrate his ability as uh, the world record holder for ingressing the uh, portable foot restraint without any handholds. Well, as, as you can see, I was setting it up, and that was uh, the setup of the PFR was helpful uh, to defining some restraint for low torques or unrestraint for low torques in terms of applying forces. Uh, once that was completed and that task was done, I ingressed the PFR, and, uh, and as you can see here, I, I did one push off, uh, essentially a leap upward, uh, using the, uh, the tethers that I had secured to the PFR to yank myself down and get my heels securely into the foot restraint. 
One of the interesting things uh, from this uh, vantage point, I was looking out over the uh, universe uh, from the payload bay there, and uh, there's, there's quite a feeling of, uh, of being alone and, and looking out and, and seeing nothing but stars. And when you lean forward a little bit uh, in the opposite direction that you see me here, uh, there, was, uh, there was no view to the, to the shuttle in sight. And uh, it's something to, to see and behold. Uh, one of the things I did note while I was up there was uh, there were thunderstorms flashing in the night. And it looked much like uh, the thunderstorms were among the stars. And, uh, and, and they appeared as supernova in the universe. Uh, while Mario was doing his foot restraint ingress, I was uh, doing an installation of a tool on the uh, airborne support equipment of the IUS there at the tilt table. It uh, proved to be a fairly challenging task because of my lack of restraint. Uh, here I am translating down the sill uh, using my left hand as uh, the propulsion mechanism and holding Mario with the right. As we had said pre-flight and earlier in the flight was uh, a demonstration of the limits of human uh, performance, if you will, and I think we found a legitimate limit there. Uh, handling an object 450 or so pounds, uh, one-handed and trying to translate with the other is just not something we want to plan on doing. And now we have some hard data to demonstrate what uh, we can and cannot do there. Here's some footage of Mario bringing me back in the other direction. Uh, a little bit of turnabout. Greg didn't have all, all the fun and, and indeed all the hard work. This is uh, what we did as well, which is probably one of our more famous events on orbit, which was the toys in space. And we were basically trying to demonstrate that simple daily objects, even toys, can have uh, physical principles attached with them that we could use to promote science among education of children. And that was really a big objective for us carrying this on board. We had two basic purposes. One of them was what we would do during the flight, which was a live interview with children from various schools around the country. And we would basically have them demonstrate toys on the ground, and we would demonstrate them on orbit to see if, if there was a difference between the two and what causes the difference. And uh, that would help solidify some science principles among the children. The other thing we did, which took considerably more time, was to film on orbit uh, many more toys than we had time to do during the live downlink session. And uh, when we brought back all that post-flight footage, uh, we've got people here at NASA that are currently in the process of weeding through all that. We did several takes with each toy. Uh, we tried to demonstrate a variety of principles with all the toys, and they're going to create a physics of toys film that will be distributed probably this fall uh, to schools all over the country and indeed internationally if, if people so desire. And the teachers are going to be able to take this product and use it as a tool by which they can get kids interested in science, first of all, because I've, I hear that nothing gets a kid hooked on science like dinosaurs in space. Well, we've got the space part covered. Uh, but if we can get the kids interested in science and, and basically sp help get their imaginations going by demonstrating some interesting things with these toys, then hopefully they'll take away something from that, uh, something very interesting about science, and it'll foster their scientific education. Uh, what we've got here, you've seen a variety of scenes here. All of these, they may look like uh, we're just having fun, but in fact, we have very real scientific principles associated with each and every one of these. For example, right here, Greg is demonstrating that a trajectory in zero G is not really feasible the way you play basketball down on Earth. Now, that was a quick shot of Gnome's burn, and uh, go ahead, Mario. As a matter of fact, the Elms burn came while I was doing this particular experiment here. You can see myself with the goggles, and there's a little laser on the end of the goggles. And, and the experiment is designed basically to test the, uh, the adaptation of the vestibular system to space and how it operates. Uh, basically, in space, all you have are your eyes to tell how you're oriented. Susan and I are pointing to a medical checklist there, and we're scrubbing up for a surgical procedure we're about to perform. Actually, what's happening here is uh, we're doing a little spoof for the people who trained us. We were the medical officers on board, and within about uh, 10 to 15 hours of medical training, we are really impressed with how much they can teach us to do in a first aid and in a contingency situation. But Susan and I are having a little fun here with our training. We pull out a full, few tools and the, uh, pull out a syringe here and uh, a few other pieces of equipment cameraman's uh, not really willing to be our subject for this procedure, but 
He I was think, similarly unimpressed with you. I think we're about to uh, coerce him into this. But uh, Susan and I felt very comfortable that with the uh, limited training that we'd received, that we could handle most any contingency on orbit for any medical procedures involved. The rest is left to your imagination. We also uh, <clears throat> had the opportunity to exercise on board a uh, relatively recent uh, mechanical device that we now carry as a rowing machine. And this rowing machine gives you lots of options on how you exercise. It not only exercises cardiovascular, but it can exercise muscles in your legs. And if you do overhead bench presses, I'm doing here, you can exercise upper arms and upper body. And it's a lot of flexibility, less vibration, and it works great. We also had the opportunity to do a little uh, experimentation with fluid dynamics and a little bit of uh, relative motion there. That was uh, M&Ms. And here are four globs of uh, liquid we're trying to to uh, blow together so that they will come in contact and form one blob. A little demonstration of surface tension and it's, uh, it's a fantastic nature in space. They tend, the blobs actually tend to bounce apart rather than come together. Here we are in uh, deorbit prep. This is a rare uh, set of footage that we had an opportunity to take during our one rev wave off. And it shows how that we have transformed this orbiting laboratory, orbiting, uh, orbiting classroom back into a spacecraft designed to fly in space. We've set up the seats on the flight deck. We've set the seat back up on the mid deck. We're coming down to the mid deck here. We've all got our insulated underwear on and we're about ready to put on our suits. We have the suits lined up on a bungee cord. We have all the helmets lined up on a bungee cord all of our harnesses, our boots are Velcroed to the wall, and we've got everything set up so that we can do an assembly line process of getting into our suits and getting into our seats and being ready for deorbit when the time comes. It's tough to find your way around when you have all those suits uh, floating around. Susan, I think you took this in the yeah, entry. I, yeah, I, w I was sitting in the aft right seat on entry, and I basically took a camcorder and made sure the battery was fresh, and basically shot a bunch of footage on entry. And what you saw there was the payload bay doors closing. Of course, we have to close those before we come back in. This is what I saw from my seat with camcorder recording, uh, both over, the, over my head up at the upper window, and what you see there is the plasma ionization on entry. And you can also tell by looking at the windows around the John and Don, around the front there, the, the plasma glow that you've so often heard uh, heard us talk about. I think the camcorder did a pretty good job of picking up on that, that orange glow that we see. Well, here we are turning around the heading alignment circle. It was a beautiful day at KSC. Good weather, and uh, the uh, ground control team told us to come on in. Uh, it was really a thrill to fly the orbiter for the first time. Uh, it uh, handles very much like our shuttle training aircraft does in training, so all that uh, all that good training was very, uh, very reassuring to fall back on. Uh, Don and I worked as a team, uh, along with Greg, as we uh, brought the orbiter down uh, over the Banana Creek here that you see. Lower the gear at 300 feet. Here's a view out of Don's window, and you can actually see the, uh, the uh, vehicle assembly building out the window. Very nice day, very little wind at the Cape. And back down to Earth after uh, a little over two and a half million miles. Uh, one of our test objectives was to deploy the drag chute after I had initiated derotation. Here's the drag chute coming out. Uh, it worked very well. Uh, kept me going straight ahead and uh, slowed the orbiter down in a hurry. Uh, the brakes were very effective. <coughs> and uh, stop the orbiter after about 8,000 feet of rollout. 